So, um, I'm going to talk about the episode first, because I have almost nothing to say about it. And then I'm going to talk about the behind the scenes, because I have a lot more to say about that. So here's the episode. Woo! Um, suddenly Spot is a she. This is the first time that's established, and will actually become a plot point later on, believe it or not. No, seriously. <laughs> uh, if you'll remember, the line is, I will feed him. That wasn't even that long ago. So, um... Anyways, <clears throat> there's actually a fan theory I've heard several times that Spot is just the name of each cat, and Data keeps making cats happen. I don't know where he's getting these cats from, but he just keeps getting new cats. And then something happens to them, and he gets a new cat, so that's terrifying. Also, by the way, this entire teaser is all about Spot. In fact, the entire B-plot is about Spot. And then the rivalry plot comes in, and then the B-plot comes in, and then the rivalry plot comes in. It takes until about the 18-minute mark for the actual main plot of the episode to start. Now, everyone in the world has pointed this out, and I hate to dip into the behind-the-scenes early, but when they wrote this episode, it came up really short. Like, way shorter than they needed to. So they're like, okay, um, let's flesh out the Jordy rivalry stuff. Flesh out, flesh out. No, we're still short. Uh, and they came up with the spot stuff as filler, and that filled out the episode. But they decided to move all the spot stuff to the beginning, so it's basically an episode about spot that then suddenly turns into an episode about the, you know, the, the environmental preachy message of stupid. So that's nice. <clears throat> I do like the idea of rivalry. It's a good concept. Um, it's, it's, I, I firmly believe in the concept of friendly rivalry. I really do. Uh, I'm the kind of person who actually thinks that competition is a good thing, w within reason, within limit. As long as you're not trying to, you know, win at any cost and murder everyone in your path, then yeah, go for it. Compete. Absolutely. Right? Hell, I compete with myself. That's kind of what speedrunning is about in its own right, is to try and beat your own time. Anybody who's played golf can talk about that, too. At least not professionally. Anyways, so I like that, and I like the way they present it. The problem is he mentions it's the ship Intrepid. Now, this was done deliberately. They were trying to reference the Intrepid as a way to kind of start sowing the seeds of what would eventually become Voyager, because Voyager is an Intrepid class, so this is supposed to be the first Intrepid. Okay, cool. Makes perfect sense. Wait, hang on, it makes no sense at all. Because here's the problem. Later on, they would state officially that the way that they got around the problem of this episode, which I'll get to in just a minute, is with the inverted thing. In fact, the idea is that the intrepid class was invented as a way to cope with the warp problem thing. But the intrepid's already over there, and it's an active ship, and they've already got a rivalry. But carry the two. Yeah, no, none of this was planned out, and that's part of the problem. As I said before, Season 7 was a mess because they just they had so much other things going on. So many other balls in the air at the same time. So um, I do sympathize, but you can tell none of this was thought out. Uh, let, me, let me move forward. I don't want to get to the behind-the-stuff scenes yet. Behind-the-scenes stuff yet. So, there are some nice edits I want to give credit to. I know that's a weird thing to mention. But there's several scenes with Data and Jordy just chatting. And it actually works for me. They go out of the way to kind of change the angle and change the camera and change things periodically to give it a sense of flow rather than just two people chatting in a room. This episode was directed by Robert Letterman, who doesn't do a lot of directing. In fact, this is his second episode he's directed ever. The other one was Ibor. Now, I think I mentioned him back there, but just in case you don't know, this guy is one of the editors for Star Trek. He has edited a huge amount of episodes on all four main shows. So, from TNG onward, I mean. He's done a lot of work, and so this was him getting a chance to be back in the director's chair, and I think he does a good enough job with what he's handed, so, you know, credit where credit is due. So then the plot starts. Yay! So these people disable the ship and then beam aboard. Can you imagine if they actually wanted to hurt the ship? Okay, beam aboard of a bomb that's going to explode in one second right next to the warp core. There we go. That's one Galaxy-class ship taken out. Man, that was easy. Kind of pathetic, really. So, early on, the episode kind of does this thing where it's like, okay, it's the Ferengi, because they were playing dead. Nope! They were actually just hit by the same disabling thing that hit the Fleming. Okay, sure. And then it's like, oh my god, it's these horribly evil terrorists. Nope! They're just crazy. <laughs> They're environmental activists. Oh wait, one of them is a terrorist. Never mind. 
No, she is. She fits the definition. Think about it for a minute. But I'll get to that in a second. So, this is actually funny. Because when they bring up the thing, they're like, oh yeah, we actually have looked at the research. Oh, you have? What did you find? And not enough data, not enough anything. It's inconclusive. You've given us a hypothesis. And that's your problem. You're terribly wrong and horrible. We needed something to happen now. It would take a whole year to get an official response going. Uh, yeah, because what you're alleg alleging here is very serious and needs to be approached very seriously. You don't want someone to wander over and be like, no, you want a careful team of experts who have equipment and time specifically allocated to looking into this situation. So, this is part of my problem with this episode. I don't like this episode. If it's clear, uh, this isn't Lamentation. This isn't anywhere near Lamentation status. But this is a bad episode. I'll talk more about that in a minute. So, <laughs> they, the, the woman, who, I don't even remember her name, but I don't care, Sakura. I don't know. I called her a terrorist rather casually earlier, but she's a moron who is also very unsympathetic. When called out on the fact that she caused potentially serious damage to both the Enterprise and to the Fleming, which I remind you is a medical ship, she's just like, yeah, it's just an inconvenience. Something had to be done. Okay, okay. Um, Jordy rightfully brings up, what if something actually more serious or more time-consuming was going through here? Ah, oh, it's their problem, not mine. Okay, okay. Um, she's also kind of a jerk in general, but... This then leads to a scene where they talk about how Data, who I remind you is Data, is actually looking over the research data. Now this makes perfect sense, because as Picard says, these are very serious allegations that should be addressed. I agree with that, completely. I would probably put my smartest people on it too. Data looks at it and says, well, this is an interesting hypothesis, but doesn't have enough research and information to actually back it. So we need to look into it in some other way. Uh, okay, that makes perfect sense. It's almost like if they'd just taken the year route and gotten out the expert, they could have sorted this out. But no, no, we wanted to rush it, and the response we got was, eh, maybe. Notice this is also specific only to this area, by the way. Like, this is, they mentioned that this is a very site specific thing. In fact, there's a quote about this, if you'll forgive me for sharing. <laughs> Chief Engineer LaForge should have maintained greater skepticism over extrapolating a highly nonlinear and universally applied conclusion with extensive ramifications based on a particular galactic zone with potentially unique characteristics. It's from the Nitpicker's Guide. And I agree completely. They all sort of assumed that she was completely right. That's not how science works. That's not how anything works. She took a shot in the dark and happened to be partially right. She was right at this time in this place under these circumstances, with this setup. This does not mean that this is a thing universally. This is something to be looked into, carefully, over time, by experts with equipment. So, I, I, this is a good time to mention that their intended solution to this is to cut off all warp travel, all of it, within the area. Now, we don't have a real-life equivalent of this. Not really. There's nothing in real life that really equates to the removal of faster-than-light travel from a galactic civilization. There have been actually several science fiction works which have addressed this exact concept before. It is ludicrously damaging. There is no way for a galactic society to exist on any level without faster-than-light transport. We can't even get to a star that is like one hop away from us without faster than light travel, without taking literally years. That's kind of the problem. That's why FTL is such an ever-present thing and so many works of fiction. It's literally mandatory. So if you want to chop off all warp travel, that's insane. Now, if your government decides to do this, if your people decide to do this, that's something that can be considered. And they, you know, Starfleet can try to set up a cordon, don't use warp drive within this area which is what they don't do, by the way. Instead, they decide to impose a warp speed limit, a warp 5, unless in emergencies. Right. I'll get to that in a minute. <clears throat> Anyways. So, this is their intended solution. Stop warp travel forever. That is basically permanent isolation. 
I'm not, even, I'm not even sure if they'd actually be able to communicate with the outside galaxy under those circumstances. Congratulations, you are back to being planet-bound. Now, I, there's a lot of issues with that. There's every issue with that. And that's also, this is going to sound strange, but that's also a short-term solution. It doesn't fix the problem. In fact, it prevents any fixing of the problem because this whole area has been quarantined off. All you're doing is preventing it from getting worse, maybe. And I say maybe because they're not studying it in depth with equipment. And you get the point. So then she responds, this is just another delay. There's only one thing I can do. I'm going to kill myself in the most stupidly pointless way possible. I, this is so many levels of dumb. Okay. Let's, let's just go down the list. So first, she kills herself, which is bad. But let's add a second layer to this. She's the foremost expert on this. So they just lost a life and an expert. All in one goal. Good, good job. That's, that's two things so far. The next and most obvious problem is she has just seriously endangered the lives of everyone on the Fleming and the Enterprise. In fact, that's the better part of the final act is, oh my god, we've got to save the Fleming. Can I just say that that was astonishingly boring, by the way? I literally have no notes from that section because it was dull as dishwater. So, it's <clears throat> the third problem. The fourth problem is now she's pretty much guaranteed that whole warp cutoff thing is probably going to happen without anyone being ready for it, or having even had a say in whether or not it's going to happen. Which brings me to point five. They mentioned this is already having severe changes to the weather patterns and, and the world that she's from. She, she has just caused possibly permanent environmental damage to her home planet. When nobody was ready, before anybody was even possibly capable of dealing with this, and in a way that's going to affect however many millions or billions of people. Good job! Way to go! You idiot! This is why I call her a terrorist, by the way. What she does is horrible, and is basically the definition of terror. The intent by which to cause fear, terror, and pain, as well as death, to a civilian populace with the intent to alter political mindset or to push an agenda. Terrorism. So, <clears throat> yeah. Then there's a scene that's actually pretty cool. It's Jordy and Data talking, and as they're talking, we see two sides of this issue. First of all, Jordy feels bad about this because, as he himself mentions, he was just openly against her. Technology and warp engines in general have been his love for so long that he actually had a holographic program for having a relationship with them. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I wasn't trying to turn that into a joke. It just kind of went that way. But seriously, this has been his, his, his passion for all his life, basically. So he took it personally. That makes sense. Let's say you really like carrots, okay? And let's say I just say, God, oh, carrots are the worst. I can't imagine anyone actually liking that crap. It's your inclination to take that personally, isn't it? Even though I may not mean that personally you will still probably take it personally because that's something you love and I have just passively insulted you, even unknowingly. Now, this is, in my opinion, one of the most common arguments I hear on the Internet, actually, which is why I use that example. But the idea of taking something like that and putting it personally, it's one of the reasons I try very, very hard to keep my own opinions to myself when I don't like something. Because I know how easy it is to take that personally when I don't mean it in such a way at all. That's why I have concepts like coffee and black licorice, because it helps to explain it in a more intellectual and calm manner rather than blah, which is admittedly my knee-jerk reaction to black licorice. Blah. But I know people like it. There's nothing wrong with people liking it. So sh you can kind of see why Jardy would take it this way. But as Data points out, she was abrasive, rude, and she was no scientist. She was an extremist. What she did is not scientifically valid, because what she did was she tried one experiment under one condition, as I mentioned earlier, which doesn't actually prove anything. It's just another piece of information to the overall puzzle that the experts will inevitably have to look into. So, right? There's also... I don't know, it's, just, it's a good conversation between the two of them, and it does help the episode. By the way, the episode, this is, uh, they mentioned the, the Fleming has biomimetic gel. I just wanted to mention that. This is when that was invented. It'll come up several times over in DS9. 
uh, probably most well known for In the Pale Moonlight, although I think Distant Voices is the other one where that comes up. So that's kind of the episode. They go in, they save the people. Woo! The end. Okay, cool. I'm not even going to talk about how insane it is that they transport people off of the Fleming at, war at what is effectively warp drive, because, uh, warp speed, excuse me. Now I know what you're thinking. Laura, what do you mean? Um, what's the range on the transporters? I'll go ahead and spare you. It's 40,000 meters. Or 40,000 kilometers, excuse me. Let me double check that, because I actually do have that written down here. Do, do, do. Yep, 40,000 clicks. I was right. That's going to take 0.13 seconds for the Enterprise to travel through at warp 1. <laughs> that is a very fast beam cycle. But of course we know science fiction writers have no sense of scale. Let's talk about the behind the scenes. So um, I'm going to go ahead and pull over this book. But I want to mention something first, okay? Every interview from every production member speaks of this episode as if it's Drek. Most of them say this is the worst episode in Season 7. Season 7 contains Genesis and Sub Rosa, along with other ones I could go into, like Journey's End. That's Season 7. And, and the production staff, and again, I double-checked this, consider this the worst episode of Season 7. Now, I don't want to talk about Sub Rosa yet. In fact, I don't want to talk about Sub Rosa at all. But I did a little looking into that. I checked... Eight separate worst of TNG lists across set eight different you know geek sites. All of them had Sub Rosa in the bottom five. Now, I just wanted to give you a bit of perspective on the fact that these people hate this episode so much because I've noticed over time that the episodes they hate and the episodes we hate, there's a bit of a gap in between them, right? And that makes sense. You know, they had this whole behind-the-scenes perspective on it. But I want to talk about something. So this is a quote from Jerry Taylor. Um, this is a wonderful premise. <laughs> one, excuse me, a wonderful environmental premise that something we take for granted is doing damage to the space around us. It was the metaphor which most closely evoked our present situation. We had tried it in many guises and it never worked. By the way, this is like an episode they've been shopping around for a while. They called it Limits. Uh, it was posited by Joe Minoski, and everyone said, No! In fact, and I quote, when Braga was told they were actually going to use limits. He said, are you crazy? Are you out of your minds? The reason we'd been avoiding it was because we were afraid it would get preachy and techy, and it was both. But anyways, back to Jerry Taylor here. The beginning of the seventh year, I sent Naren, that's Naren Shankar, and Brannon, Brannon Braga, to a big breakfast meeting of an environmental watchdog group we had back in Hollywood, and they came back inspired. Naren was so galvanized. I want to take a crack at limits. I want to do this. This is important, and I agreed. It was a story I really wanted to do. <laughs> and she just starts talking about how it fell apart basically from there. Everyone says about how awful this was. But I want to share one other thing, because this is funny to me. This is from Ronald D. Moore. Force of Nature was something I fought for early on. I went to the wall for. We had a big meeting with Rick and Mike and Jerry, and we all got on our high horses and sit, went in there, and we felt about this episode saying, we want to do this, we want to make a statement. We want to change the Star Trek universe forever. This is important, and this is right, and we should do it. And now I'm going, what was I thinking? Because now we have this warp speed limit, and every third episode we need permission to go fast. It was such a great idea and concept. We always said that dealing with environmental on this show is incredibly difficult. It's, it's hard to do a show about the ozone, because the ozone is huge and non-personal. It's hard to make it dramatic. We thought we had found a way to personalize it, and it became Force of Nature. This then leads to like three or four other quotes by other people who also looked at this episode like it was crap, including Michael Piller, who actually, this is funny. Remember, at this point, Piller was pretty much working full-time over on DS9. Force of Nature inspired us to have several long meetings on where the season was going. I felt we were letting it slip away. This is when also when Piller came back and started working more full-time on TNG Season 7, when they were producing... Uh, force of Nature. Now, <clears throat> I decided to do a little research here. How many more times do you think this warp limit thing that they wanted to permanently change Star Trek, how, how many more times do you think this comes up? Ever. Once in Pegasus, and once in Eye of the Beholder. That's it. As I mentioned earlier, 
They then decided that the thing that the Intrepid class does was designed to fix this problem, so they never had to worry about the warp speed limit again. So, huh. <laughs> so the only lasting change by this is to the woman's home planet, which is now probably permanently screwed. And they may have to actually do a planetary evacuation. But seriously, for a moment, can I just talk? Just This is going to go kind of off script. I'm, I'm done with notes. I'm done with my, my detail or my book and all that. <sighs> this episode sucks. And I think the reason why it sucks is threefold. First, they have no idea what they're doing with it. They wanted to do an environmental message show. The problem is, well, let's be honest with ourselves, in my opinion, Star Trek is usually at its best when it's not trying to be preachy, but when it actually hits a point rather properly. DS9 has done this several times. Even TNG has done this several times. This is preachy, especially when they're like, oh, she was totally right all along. No. She wasn't. Thank God someone wrote words into Data's mouth to point out that no, she wasn't right. She got lucky. She gambled, and the long odds paid off. They wanted to do this thing properly, and she was impatient. Not wrong, per se. Not, we weren't spitting on her face and telling her she was stupid. This was just, hey, let's take this seriously and act appropriately. Picard gave his personal guarantee that he would push this right to the Council. And I guarantee they're going to listen to the captain of the flagship whose main mission is exploration. Especially if that person is Jean-Luc Picard, who has a hell of a political clout back home. They were taking this seriously. She's just an idiot. That's another problem here. So, it's too preachy. The, the main character, the, the woman, is, is a moron. Which, of course, leads to the obvious problem with the fact that this is kind of the equivalent of, to quote a friend of mine from all the way back in, like, 95 or whatever, um, this is kind of like trying to have Smokey the Bear show up and burn down forests to show how bad it is. Thanks, Smokey. I got the picture without the demonstration. I'm actually reminded of the episode uh, Memorial over on Voyager. How will we know if it's bad to kill people if we don't see it? Gee, maybe we can just know, without having to ever done it, that it's bad to kill people. I've never killed anyone in my life that you know of. And, I'm sorry, I'm joking, I'm joking. I haven't. I have never killed anyone in my life. And God willing, I never will. And I don't need someone to come up and tell me, Hey, hey, murder's bad. Really? No frickin' duh! The final reason that this episode really just fails and is stupid, is it has no consequence. Now, this is actually tied into... If you notice, there's actually a loop here. They didn't think it out, which leads to a poor villain and bad execution, which leads to lack of consequences, which is because of not being thought out. All three of these points are really tied into each other. They wanted to do a permanent status quo change. Yes, absolutely. I am hugely in favor of massive status quo changes. I always have been. I always will be. However, if you're going to do a massive status quo change, you need to think carefully and approach it with experts, with the time and equipment, and y you get the analogy. It's not something that you just go out and blow up on. It's something you have to think about carefully, approach carefully, and map out how it's going to affect things going forward. And you have to decide, are you willing to live with the consequences of this? You, it's very possible as a writer, several writers have, have basically hampered their own storytelling and been like, whoops, and just kind of undone it, which is what they do here. Two episodes, it's referenced, and then there's a vague mention of the fact that they solved the work problem, and then it's never brought up ever again. Because they were just like, yeah, that was a mistake, under the rug, under the rug. I, I can't even rewrite this one. That's the problem. This is such a, a, a colossal failure at every level that I don't even know what to do to rewrite it. I, I thought about maybe just ejecting the thread of the week, but that's always my suggestion. I'm tired of saying it. But that is my suggestion. I mean, if I'm being honest, that is my suggestion. Just get rid of that. Make it an episode about her and him and their dynamic. Get a little insight into Jordy, his troubled relationship with his sister, and how he's still co tr coping with his mother's death, which, by the way, was part of the original plot and how he's got this rivalry thing, and he's starting to let it get a little bit out of hand because of how much it's upsetting him, and how much she's upsetting him, and finally Data has to come in and be like, look, make it a character piece. 
I don't mind a good Jordy episode, do you? I'm sorry, that sounds accusatory. I, I'm just, I'm upset in general, and that came out my toes, I apology. Would you mind, like more, more neutrally, would you mind a, a good Jordy piece? What do you guys think? I got nothing else. We're not even... What, what, what do you got coming up here? Hang on, let, let's look at our list. Let's look at our list here. There's just This is just it's starting to get draining. <laughs> I was like, alright, Season 7 won't be that bad. I mean, in fairness, it actually hasn't been that bad. So what do we got? We got uh, Inheritance. Oh my god. Okay. And then Parallels. I like Parallels. I like Pegasus. Homeward. The worst... The, the worst TNG Prime Directive episode. And then Sub Rosa. The Lower Decks. Lower Decks is good, yeah. Thine Own Self. Eh. Masks. Oh my god, I forgot about masks. I forgot about masks. Then Eye of the Beholder. Genesis. Journey's End. Firstborn. Bloodlines. Emergence. Preemptive Strike, which... Eh, I mean, that's a Voyager vehicle. And then All Good Things. That's, uh, off the top of my head, that's like four episodes which qualify for potential lamentation status. <sighs> I guess we'll see when we get there. As I've said many times, I never decide until we're there. So I'll just focus on the next one now, which is Data's mom, who suddenly exists. Oh, I hope you've enjoyed, guys. I'll see you next time.